cool. So Dave, thank you so much for coming in today. How, how are you? I'm good. Yeah. Busy. Are you okay? I'm good, yeah. We're coordinated. Look we are this. coordinated, actually, yeah. aren't we? <laughs> Should we text each other? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but I've, I've been dying to get you on for a while, obviously being a, a proud scouser and from Liverpool. I've always been really keen to find out uh, the story behind Sound City, really, and I guess your story of, of everything that you've done um, in Liverpool and beyond with um, with the music industry and just trying to find out, you know, what has made everything that you've worked on um, such a success. So in fitting with the name of the podcast, Business Keeps On Dancing, we want to find out how you keep your business dancing and everything that that fits uh, in between that. And really today is about shining a spotlight on you because I imagine you're often, you know, in the background planning all these things. Um, but I want to find out about what makes you, you unique um, and what has made your journey so successful. Um, so I feel like Sound City would be a good a good starting point, um, but also for anyone who's not familiar with with any of the, um, the businesses and, and the brands that you run, can you give us a quick overview of, of everything that you, you look after? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a good title, Sound City is a um, international music business conference as well as an emerging talent festival, which has been going for 15 years now, 16 years really, because the first time we ever did it, we did it at South by Southwest. Okay. And then we launched it in Liverpool in 2008 as part of the capital of culture year at that time. Seems so long ago that now. So we're 15 years young this year um, of our events in Liverpool. Um, but our events around the world, you know, we see, it was, Sound City was always about planting flags, really, around the world, really, um, with the idea of trying to encourage business and talent spotting um, globally for acts. So not an homogenization thing, so not just saying just take our British talent and that's it, really. It was always about looking at, at global talent, really, both business talent and and and, and musical talent. Um, over the past 15 years, you know, we've, I can't remember, you know, I think we, we are, you know, in terms of business growth developments, I think in, in Liverpool alone, we've, we've probably generated in the region of over 50 million for businesses in this Liverpool City region, uh, you know, and then and then I don't know what that would be globally, and then some of the artists that we've helped along the way, you know, we've we've had acts like Ed Sheeran who we famously paid fifty pounds for two shows, Florence and the Machine, don't think we paid her much more than that at the time, <laughs> um, Bastille, Jungle, Adele. Um, the list goes on, really. You know, for the past fifteen years, one of the things that we've been very very good at is, is is kind of finding talent before before it's kind of uh, before they became successful really and helping them you know helping them both the managers of that talent and the talents themselves you know the bands or the artists themselves um and and that's kind of what that's that's our mantra that's what we'll we, we keep doing really and that's that's kind of that feeds into everything else that we do but in a nutshell i guess that's that's what sound city is and then touching on the the artist side of things as well with with modern sky, um, what kind of things do you work on with with artists and up and coming talent? Well, modern sky was is, was um, I sold part of Sound City a few years ago to a company in China called Modern Sky. Modern Sky in China is the largest independent entertainment company in in uh, mainland China, um, run and, and operated by a guy called Shen Li Wei, who's a massive anglophile. Um, was hugely influenced by British bands when he was growing up. And um, and so he knew about Sound City. He knew about another event I'd worked on in the city uh, from many years ago. Uh, and, and so when he found out I was looking for another partner with Sound City, he agreed to buy a stake in Sound City, but on the premise I would help him grow his company outside of China. So Modern Sky in the UK is, is a, primarily a records a management company. We do have a publishing side of what we do as well. But we, we primarily sign British artists, but we also <clears throat> work with some of the talent coming out of China. So in China, some of the biggest acts in mainland China are signed to Modern Sky. And when I say big, you sort of put that into some kind of context. These are artists that do billions of streams, you know, in their home territories, hip-hop, guitar bands, um, quite dangerous folk music, you know, because not not traditional Chinese folk, but, but these are kids singing agic political pop um, folk, um, you know, that's quite um, 
not against the government, but criti critical of the government, maybe. So it's it's very edgy kind of music. And um and so we we've worked with a number of those artists from China to tour them in other parts of the world. Well, in other parts of the world like the USA, UK, and also parts of Europe. And that goes back to what I was saying before about that ethos that spreads through everything that we do, that it's not one-way traffic. It's not like take our McDonald's brand and we don't want to eat anything you give us. Um, you know, it's 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 about how do we how do we work both ways, really? So working with Chinese acts in other parts of the world and then in the UK signing some big bands over the last maybe five years, you know, bands like Crawlers. We just signed to Polydor Interscope, a band called The Lathams. We had a big, big album with last year. Um, a young girl called Brooke Combe, signed, we signed to Island Records. And Jamie Webster, who was famously, we, I discovered on a plane, going to Madrid when Sound City was doing the stage at Madrid. And then he told me he wrote all these songs really, you know, so we, we, we work with, with artists, you know, for, from just what we would consider to be, to be great music. So the two companies kind of, from a ethos point of view, they're very complimentary and they cross fertilize between each other, really. A lot of the staff work for both companies. Okay. And, where did this all start then? Because, you know, it's quite clear you've had such a passion for the music industry for, for so long. Um, what did your journey look like before all of this kind of, you know, started to take off? Sometimes you'd like to say the journey was planned, really, but it never <laughs> is, is it? You know, I think, I can't remember who made the quote, but it certainly wasn't my quote, but I like the quote. It was, it was somebody who said, life only makes sense when you look backwards. Yeah. You know, because it, it, if, if you just said going forward the way it's going to go you, it just doesn't make sense sometimes i think it goes back to what you just said it's been a passion for music which was the which was the kind of catalyst the, the starting point for it all so when i was a kid i was in bands like a lot of people who, who i know in the music industry they started in bands i am um, i was signed to a major record label when i was relatively young and then when we got dropped from rca bmg at that time I just decided, well, you know, I'm I'm a late twenty something. What am I going to do now? Because yeah. all I'd ever done was music. You know, I'd only ever been every job I'd done was a means to an end. Really, it, it wasn't it wasn't a career choice. It was just to pay money so I could be in bands. Really, while I got well, and then when I got my record deal for for you know a couple of years, I had the money. But then when I got dropped, you're back to square one. Really, so I just decided then, you know, I I want to stay in music, and and I guess. At that time, I had so many relationships of people I knew then in the music business. And you find out it's a relatively small place. So that goes back 30 years now. That's a little bit longer than that. Well, yeah, 30, 30, just over 30 years. And all of those relationships that I had in that those days are pretty much, as long as if, if the people that are still in the business I'm still friends with, and if I don't do business with them, I still speak to them on a fairly regular basis, really. Because, you know, I might invite them to Sound City or it might, you know, to, to, to speak or whatever else it might be. Yeah. And then I work with them with Modern Sky. And so so uh, relationships was a very important part of it in the, in, in the when when we when I lost my deal. And it made me realise um, passion is everything in, in this business. And, and, you know, a good business acumen, but, you know, passion, don't, you know, a lot of people are data driven these days, you know, and and and, and it, data is important, but it shouldn't be the defining thing of everything, not in my opinion, anyway. Um, but but they were, you know, so I'm going off off piece there, but being in a band, losing a record deal, deciding I was want to be in it, and then from then on, I, I I worked I've worked in everything from owning venues to management to publishing to records to promoter festivals everything yeah um, i'm that? a master of all trades jack of all <laughs> trades master of none <laughs> but you know the full quote is but better than being a master of none yeah so was that in, intentional when you were kind of hopping about were you, were you trying to just get as much experience from as many parts of the industry as possible uh, again uh, no not really uh, it was it was needs it was it was going where my heart took me so when i got into when i when i lost my record deal i got into management um not because I thought, you know, management's a good business decision. It was just, it was just, you know, I want to stay in music. How do I stay in music? Uh, okay, um, well, managing seems a relatively easy thing to do because you just got to go and find the talent. And I, and I, I always think great music people. There's no, there's no training for that necessarily. It's just good ears. And how do you get good ears? Well, you have a good record collection and you have a good self belief, really. 
And I always considered I had good self-belief and good taste. And uh, and I had a good record collection, in my opinion, you know. And so so it was just going out and finding things that that I thought were great, really. And so some of the early bands I worked with was a band called Sub Sub, who became Doves. Okay. And so I managed them with a guy called Dave Rofe. Yeah. Um, and we had a huge hit with a song called Ain't No Love. Um, and, and, and you know, and so so that that was my entry into it. And I, and I guess just before that, I'd managed the farm from Liverpool. Wow, yeah. So I managed the farm and I ran produce records. So I'd, I'd, I'd had some understanding of running a record label, albeit, you know, very small label, but we had a lot of money because we, the funding for that label was, 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 was quite significant from the source it came from. Uh, and so it was just plotting my way through really, you know, you know, I, I fell in love with that band through, through Sub Sub. I met um, Rob Gretton who, who, who managed Joy Division and New Order and because Rob, Owned the label that they were signed to, because uh, it's just they just sold Factory Records to, to London Records at that time, and Robert started two new labels. One was called Rob's Records, very ingenious, which was his dance one, and then his more guitar band one was Manchester Records because he'd sold it to London Records. He so he thought I'll start a label called Manchester Records. So I was I was kind of that that was my introduction to them through through Rob I met. Tony Wilson, and then through Tony, I ended up working on In the City, and so on with Phil Sachs, who was, who was also a great friend of mine who managed the Happy Mondays. You know, so it was just friends, you know, kind of making new friends and and then going from management to discovering, uh, you know, working on In the City to, to, to then thinking, you know, if two friends of mine were buying a venue, I thought, yeah, I'd like to have a go at that, you know. So in, I bought, a, bought the mask in Liverpool, you know, um, and, and and so so got involved in that. So just passionate about it, really. You know, there, there was no there was no business plan. You know, I always remember when people used to say, I think on one point when we were looking for money, and you went to a bank, and they said, uh, Yeah, what we this is a good idea. What we need is a business plan. And I went out and thought, well, that's never going to happen, then, is it? Because I'm never going to write a business plan <laughs> because, you know, I haven't got the time or the energy to do stuff like that. I just wanted people, to, if I needed money, I just wanted people to give me the money for yeah. it, really, and just <laughs> just go, just be as excited as I am about it, really. And if they couldn't see that, then then doing, then that, of course, now we do forecasts on everything now. But, but in those days, it, it, I didn't do forecasts on anything, really. I was just going where the wind blew me. Yeah. So to speak, really. So it was, it was, it was, it was, it was really good times. You know, in that, in those times, you know, to put that into some kind of narrative for the times, you know, it was the the early nineties. Um, you know, I lost my deal in nineteen ninety one. So we'd we'd had Acid House kicked off in eighty eight, which felt like punk rock all over again. And in the nineties, you felt like you could do anything in, in those those early days. You know. Um, Everything was good, you know, without going into too much detail, but it was all good. And so you just thought, well, I don't want to, there's no way I'm ever going back to a proper job, you know, or ever doing a proper job. I've, I've just got to do this really, you know, in in any which way I can really. You, you've mentioned that Tony Wilson was was such a big influence on you, um, you know, often dubbed as, as Mr. Manchester. How did he influence you? What What, what did that relationship look like? About his attitude as much as anything else, because Tony was an awful businessman, you know, um, and, and you know, I'm not speaking out of turn by saying that. If he was here now, he would say the same thing, you know. Um, but what he was was visionary, absolutely visionary. You know, he was, and, and, and he knew how to put a spin on things. That was the media side of him, really, you know. I mean, he's been, he's been kind of... Um, He's been quoted so many times for some of the wonderful things he, you know, some of the wonderful lines. You know, we we make we make art, we make history, not money. You know, it's a great line. It's a great line. You know, um, it felt like someone should have said it before, but you know, and maybe they did, but Tony took credit for it. You know, that 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 was his great thing. And and I think his other thing was perception. Perception is everything. Don't re, you know? Reality means nothing. And I think there's a you know I, those things they had a big impact on me at the time. Um, because if you if you can sell someone that goes back to the business plan thing before, if you can sell someone the dream, then they'll come with you. You know they'll come with you, and that's what Tony and the rest of the people at Factory and and, and the subsequent businesses that were involved after that, including the Hacienda, that's what it'd always been about. It'd been about selling the dream, really. You know, um, and so that kind of thing I thought was was hugely important. Is 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 is, is way that. Um, 
you know, he would always, he would always, um, what's the one I'm trying to think? He'd always have an angle on anything really, you know, I think, thinking the angle, you know, I think, I'm trying to think of examples again. I always loved it when on in the city one year where we did a thing where he said, uh, you know, I think that it was the rise of the internet and, and it, those days seem so, so daft now, but you know, the internet was a new thing then. And, and, um, and there was all the talk of um, Napster killing the music industry and so on at that time. And, um, and the porn industry was doing particularly well, you know, online at that time. Probably still is, actually. And I always remember in the city, you know, he, he was so, he, he compensationally, he would come up with, with this idea, you know, he said, uh, what, can the, uh, what can the porn industry teach the music industry about how to do better business? And I just thought that was genius, really, to, to do that. And so looking at those angles, and, and there was always a kind of a slight arrogance and a slight swagger and a slight confrontation in everything he said, with a smile, really, you know, with a smile. There was never any real anger in it, but but there was always a smile and a kind of a cheekiness about what he did, you know, and and, and I like that. And I think with Sound City, if, if I've stolen anything, um, probably a lot, but, you know, it's always that thing, do it up north, you know, we, 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 you know we, we're from the north. You, one of our mantras has always been, you know, what is it, that mantra that's, that, that's, that was influenced by Tony was, you know, you're two hours away from a train, you're two hours away from London on a train. You're a nanosecond away from anyone in the world with with technology. Why do you need to be anywhere else but the North, really? Yeah. You know, and and that's that and that came from Tony, really. You know, that that kind of inspiration for never wanting to go to London. Of course, I'm in London every week, like a lot of people are, and I travel a lot with the work that we do. But I've never been swayed by wanting to go and live in London. I've, it doesn't, you know, the, the London dream for me, doesn't exist. You know, there's no better place to live than than in Liverpool, Manchester, or the towns and hamlets in between, right up here, really. You know, it's it's the, the, the we're already in the best place in the world for talent and for everything else, you know. So so there's, there's the, the London dream has never swayed me, really. And, and again, that, that kind of thing came from... It made me believe. Tony made me believe, yeah, you can do it up here, really, you know. It's, it's so well documented what, you know, what the nightlife and music scene was was like around the time of, of the Hacienda. What was it like being from Liverpool and kind of watching on? Like, what, what was it like in Liverpool at that time? Was it just those- it, it, All cities were great. You know, Liverpool and Manchester have always had that competitive streak. You know, someone once described it as a budgie peck in a mirror, you know, and that's kind of <laughs> what it's like, really, because we have more in common than we care to admit. Yeah. You know, we are, we, we're the same, really, aren't we? Slightly different accents, but we're the same. We all come from kind of Irish heritage or Welsh heritage or, you know, you, you know, the, for, you know, and, and then Afro-Caribbean or whatever it might be. You know, there's the, the, the heritage and the influences and the culture is identical. If we were in America, we'd be one city. You know, we'd be one city. It's only in the UK you have these bizarre things where 30 miles, miles apart, we think we're really different from each other. So we're not. But but what it is, what it is, what is what it's fostered is this competitive streak in us that, that you see through football. Um and you see it in music and you see it in business and you see it in the in the way that we are. So in those days, you know, the Hacienda was was, you know claiming it was the best club in the world. But then Cream were coming through saying, no, we're the best club in the world. You know, so even then you had two super clubs rivaling each other, really, you know. And you'd go to Haas and it'd be an amazing night. And you'd go to Cream on a on a Saturday in those, you know, in any days, actually, you know, I don't want to be too snobby about as it got older Cream, because, you know, as, but it was, as it was growing, when it went from one room to two rooms to three rooms Cream, it was special, really, you know. And so, so they were really, 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 really great days, really. You know, it, it, it's it was because it felt it wasn't just the drugs and everything. It felt kind of, you know, it, it felt just a very, very exciting period to live through. Really, it felt you could do anything. I mean, at that time as well, I was working with um, with Voodoo, so, so that was a big techno club. So I was working with Sam Jones, who's sadly no longer with us, and Claire, his partner. So they were running this hugely cool, probably the coolest techno club. In Europe, really, I would argue that they they did. I didn't I had nothing to do with that, but I was running their record label for them. So we were doing great records with Andrew Weatherall and Sabres of Paradise and um, Green Velvet and you know some some amazing artists at that time. And, and and the accessibility to these people was so easy as well. You know, it was there was no kind of it didn't feel like there was any routes to market. Really, you could get near the DJs, you could get near everyone. It was still in its kind of infancy of of, of people 
commercialising it and making it very, very difficult for you to get near the people you wanted to get near. With, with, with a record coming out, how would that be promoted back then? Obviously, social media is not a thing. It, no, it wasn't. It, it was very traditional. So, so dance record would be ve- very much DJ led. You know, it was really, you know, you would we would do mailers of maybe trying to think now, but you know, the the, the twelve inch records in a mail in, in a mailer, maybe three hundred, four hundred of them through through your you know through our through our marketing companies, and you were just you know hoping that some of the key DJs. You know, for us then, DJs would have been someone like Carl Cox, who was on the rise then. You know, so if Carl Cox was spinning it, then that that was that was a good indicator because playing to a lot of people, it would cross it over really, not just cross it over to to more DJs, but it would cross it over to the punters as well because a lot of people bought records in those days as well. You know, there was a lot of bedroom DJs that maybe never ever in the same ways that were, there are a lot of garage bands now. Yeah. In those days, there was lots of bedroom DJs that never maybe made it. But would play to fifty of their mates in in a village hall, wherever you know, in in, in wherever it might be, in, in Stoic or whatever it may be, you know, because 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 kids wanted to be DJs then, you know, they they didn't really want to be in guitar bands in those days. The the, the DJ culture was very much on the rise, um, and and there was a sense that anyone could do it, and there was a sense very punk rock, you know, anyone can do it, and I've got as much chance of succeeding as you 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 or you know you, you know as long as I can mix and. Got good ears again, good record collections, good ears, and be able to mix. So it was, it was, it was good times. But the the thing between Liverpool and Manchester was 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 always there. You know, there's a myth. I actually don't think it is a myth, but you know, they, they said for for a time the violence stopped on the terraces. You know, because of what everybody was doing. You know, people stopped fighting and started hugging each other on the terraces. <laughs> so as much as anything else, but it did feel like that. It did feel like that. Even football fans, because I've you know I I've, I love my football, but I've never been one for never understood violence really but um but but it did feel like even the hooligans that you knew for a while were hugging each other you know and and and, uh, and not fighting good good time of the uh good timing of this podcast just after the uh the derby on sunday as well <laughs> exactly oh, sorry, yeah. on tuesday <laughs> um when you when you talk about uh, launching records and, and labels how does that contrast into what goes into it in in this day and age now like when you're Launching a record with an artist, what what goes into that? Well, the one thing that's never changes is is, is good music. You've got to find good music. Every, everything begins and ends with a great song. Um, you know, without the song, particularly in, in the music we work with, you know, if you're working with a, com- a more commercial pop, I think that's a different game, and I can't really talk about that game because it's I understand, I understand it, but it's not my game. So I and I, I'm not I'm not equipped to 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 kind of work in that area really. But what with what we do, the kinds of artists we work with, it's it's it, you know it's about great songs, finding great artists, and then there's lots lots of other things. You know, we we touched on it briefly when you said about social media. I mean, social media is very prevalent now, and so so artists you know have to have a presence on social media. You know, and is that something you sit down with artists or the teams? Yeah, and and it's a blessing and a curse. You know. You know, some artists can handle it very, very well. We've been through a lot of artists in in the last, particularly the last 12 months coming out of, you know, the lockdown or the last eight months, whatever how long it is now. And um, coping with mental health issues that that relate to social media particularly. Um, You know, particularly when you get, when people... You know some of these kind of trolls that that, that exist in, on some of these platforms that are just there to, to. It seems just to destroy people's lives. You know, and I don't mean their careers necessarily, but I mean their their mental health as much as anything else. You know, so 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 that's a really bad part about it. It's how you navigate that. It's a very difficult thing to navigate with artists because on the one hand, it's a very very important part of the business model, but on the other hand, it can be very. Um, it can take its toll on on people, you know. We, even ourselves, who people, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm on social media. It gets me down every now and again, you know. And and I, and I'm I'm kind of faceless, you know. I'm I'm kind of to to a great extent in the shadows. When you're living with your your face right, you know, in the public eye, it can be a very very difficult thing to exist on. Really, I've I've read I've read a lot about art, a lot of artists feeling burnout with the 
the pressure to be a content creator. Like yeah. artists just want to make music and, and perform, but there's is that something you've, you've experienced or well, seen where they, they feel like they need to be documenting every every single thing that they do to, to get the attention? 100%. We, we've seen it a lot. We try to take pressure off. So we try to, with our artists, we try to look at, so we, we, we will we will always sit down with our artists and, and try to plot, um, you know, what needs doing, when it needs doing. So so at least there's a plan there and at least they can see then where the peaks and the troughs are. So begin to understand those things and get, and, and I suppose when you know that, you can mentally prepare yourself for that as well. And then other things that we do, we now have our own social media support team. So with a lot of our artists now, we, they have their own team around them that will support them doing the content for TikTok, um, Instagram, um, and, and whatever other platforms. I mean, TikTok is the big one now that, 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 that you know, all our artists are living on. Um, and that can be very time consuming and, and, and you know, and, and also um, get them to think of ideas all the time. So they have their own cre- creative teams around them. And, and I've got to say, so far it's working well. But you've you've always got to be aware of it. You've always got to manage it. With one of our artists, just just two or three weeks ago, uh, he had a really really bad time on social media, so we had to pull him out of it all really. And luckily, it's not he's not in the middle of album campaign or anything like that. So so it's it's not too much of an issue for anyone really. And so we just said just have a break from it. We still manage all the 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 platforms, but he's not he's not involved in it. You know, we just taking his you know his voice is still there but it's not his voice if that makes sense it's yeah. the people who work with him on his team because they know his voice very very well and we're not even getting him to approve anything or anything we're just taking him completely out of it for some time so it, it is it's it, but unfortunately that 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 is the world we live in right now you know who knows whether web version three will change all that really you know we wait and see i hope so because it does feel like it's not the artist calling the shots anymore. And, and, and I've also got to say, not even necessarily their fans, really. It does seem driven by other, you know, if you look at the pornographic amounts of money that Spotify make and, and Twitter and, and all of these companies, really, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not driven for the, for the good of the artist or their fans a lot of the time. It's driven for other kind of other agendas, really, you know. Is that something you're actively looking into at the minute? Things like Web three, NFTs. We, we NFTs, yes, for the right artists. Um, it's not for every artist, really, you know. Um, and uh, but I think everyone's looking at NFTs at the moment, aren't they? You know. So we we've been looking for them for a while, you know. But it's 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 just how you do it, really. You know. I I I mean, don't get me wrong. I I I I, I love the idea and I love innovation. You know, I like the ideas of that, but. I'm not quite sure it's what it will be yet, you know. Um, I like some of the things where, some of the NFC stuff where it's, where you have the stuff that lives, you know, it, on your phone or whatever else, but also you have a, you do have something tangible that's yeah. in the real world as well. Sentiment seems to be something that needs to be managed carefully from some of the stuff I've seen at NFTs. I've seen it yeah. um, start Yeah, there's some really stuff. lazy stuff and it does it does the uh, creators a lot of damage as well if you look at some of the damage that's been done. So that's why we're quite careful really because, you know, what it took you three years to build, you could destroy overnight if you get it wrong with, an, with the wrong NFT. So so we, we, we do look into it. And then web version three, yeah, who knows really? We You know, we just... Uh, it's 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 that's all brand new, and that's the wild west all over again. We're just kind of seeing where that goes. So I'm just, it's just really I, I I mean I don't know a great deal about it other than it's coming. I read something on online this morning about um, is it Universal just point, appointed someone who's going to be just head of the Web three development, really innovation development. Mm. So so like 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 everything you know. We'll look at what they do and try and st- if it's anything good, we'll try and steal their ideas. <laughs> yeah, I've I've seen artists like like Nas the rapper and a few other artists who have done um uh royalty shares. So if you buy this NFT, you also get Yeah, so that blockchain stuff. Yeah, that's so so some of that. I mean, yeah, so we, we um without going into too much detail about our contracts, we do try to be fairly innovative with, with and you know, very artist friendly with 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 the way we we, we structure our contracts contracts. Um, because obviously we're in the business of records, so so we, we need to kind of engage with artists somehow on a business front, really, you know. Yeah. Um, but by the same token, um 
try and empower the artist as much as you can and also ensure that they what they own is still either theirs or goes back to them as soon as it can really you know so it's in terms of copyrights are, and everything else are there any um because i guess the only way to learn about these things is to either look outside our own industry or, or see who's doing it well um are there any like really good examples you've, you've seen of things like nfts because i think the thing for me and again i've I've seen it start to be used in football now and the sentiment has just been all over the place because it just looks like a money-making scheme a lot of the time. But uh, with that example, with Nasi was actually giving fans with the NFT, you then get a share of the artist royalties. And then obviously you're trying to give fans something that's either money can't buy, something tangible as well. So it still feels like a, a collectible in that sense. Yeah. But yeah, is there anything that you've, you've seen? I think those then? things, but as long as they're meaningful, because I've seen some of those copyright ones as well. And they don't really. I've also been in the. I've been in meetings where I've had presentations. You know, where with because with different companies that that want to work with you on on you know NFT. You know, on the on the fulfillment of the NFT side, and they they've given examples. I won't say the cut the the, the artists because then you'd know the companies. But well, you know where they say, oh yeah, so we're working with Artist X, and they're giving some of their royalty away. You know, so so others said, but don't worry about it because they're not really. It's 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 completely unmeaningful. I'm thinking, well, but that just defeats the object then of what you're doing because you're saying on the one hand you're doing something really meaningful, but then on the other hand it's not meaningful at all, really. So it just sounds like you're trying to rinse people, really. Exactly. And, and, and and so I don't like that. Um, but I also don't think artists should be giving away their copyrights either. <laughs> um, you know, so so it's 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 the fine line of of of, of where you go with that. I think that's really interesting. Some of that stuff for me. I like the stuff where it where it crosses both things really tang, tangibility and intangibility. We we were looking at some stuff um, of, of money can't buy things really, you know. But but then, and, and the idea I always like the idea. So we're trying to put our put our kind of heads in 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 the role of the consumer, you know, the fans themselves. And and so there's one particular artist who's very connected to to football culture, and and this idea of um, as footy fans, when you were young, collecting, remember you used to collect, or you, I don't know if you did, but collect football cards. We used to collect football cards all the yeah. time. We traded them. Panini stickers. Yeah, stuff, panini yeah. stickies and all that. And they, they were great because, they, you know, they, they were very tangible, but but there was a sense, you know, you just shared them with your mates and you, and you would trade them as yeah. well, you know. And so we were trying to find a way, how can we do something like that with, with their music and everything else, that, that artists that, that maybe, that there were several different versions of it and, you know, maybe a lucky bag version of it that you got that one, but then I could trade you with bits of that yeah. if you wanted that. So, so just trying to encourage that cross collaborative stuff really. And then, um, and then looking at something that was at the top of that chain and then doing a series of them that led to a moment. Okay. So, so if you did like, you know, one series or another series, another series, another series, and then it leads to a moment in time with something that was really tangible that you could raise a lot of money maybe for a charity that the artist was was kind of um, that the artist was really uh, engaged with, you know, something like that. Yeah. So it's those types of things, really. We, I keep, you know, I, like I said, we've been talking about NFTs now for, I'm, I'm no joking, at least eight, 18 months, honestly, when we first saw some of the art, first art stuff and we've still not done one because we've got about so far along the line sometimes because at one point we were going to start our own company and try and generate the NFTs. And then all the bad stuff came out about how much energy they used to do. We thought, oh, we better not get involved in this then. then you know. And then you're trying to find one that's companies that, that are kind of doing it in a kind of ethical way, making the to tokens in an ethical way um, because of your, you know, your environmental policies and all that kind of stuff. And so it's just, just been a bit of a minefield, to be honest. So, so I, I know loads about them. I've seen probably much every campaign that's going on. Um, but we've never still done one ourselves. Um, you know, because the one particular artist has just backed out this week of a campaign that we, we we were pretty much set up to do, because they read all about one that in football, one of the football players, the way it backfired completely. Yeah. And they came and said, "Oh no, I'm not doing this. I've just seen what's going on with this." You know, and they got very very nervous. So you've got to respect the decision on it, really. You know. Yeah, and it's interesting. I guess the the artists are putting the face to it as well. So there's a bit yeah. Of, um... And and it's their career, you know. At the end of the day, it's their career. And you know, if you're just going for a quick win, which we we've not we've never been going for a quick win, it was always to add value and, and to be interesting, really. To to do interesting art is what 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 we want to do. It's it's yeah, money of course is is a, is a part of it, but more importantly is 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 
is is is it having a laugh and is being an exciting and the experience yeah. of it exactly so if the fan has a good time doing it then you know then, then it's good really you know yeah I, I like the idea of making it experiential if you're going to do an nft or a collectible or gamification something that you're actually yeah. going to get from it and it not just being yeah. this digital thing or something one like of our other bands so. crawlers they're, they're very much they they're working with is it doomsday uh game so we're just getting into all that game game, game inside now because they lend themselves so much to that so that's 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 the next way which everyone seems to be talking about right now as well you know but um we'll see where that takes us yeah but i love that's again going back to what we said before really you know just something that came along thought wow this sounds good yeah so we'll go off on a little journey on that now you know yeah see where that takes us for the next six months <laughs> how, how do you find keeping your finger on the pulse with with things because you've what you've been in the music industry since I think you've 80s, always got 90s. to be just, just, just open-minded to things, really, and and recognize that change will happen, you know, and and you know you either like change or you don't like change. I quite like change because I get bored quite easily. So so if I kind of um, you know, Sound City, for example, is a thing of that. You know, where I remember when we set Sound City up and we we did it for several years and it was making loads of money and it was a, everyone loved it, the formula of it. But I got bored of it and a couple of the others who've been working with it from day one. We'd only done it five or six years. And we said, let's take it to the docks. You know, we just said, let's go down the docks, which cost us an arm and a leg to do. But it just felt exciting because I just found these this dockland space, you know. And I just thought, wow, this would be great for a festival, really, an inner city festival. And so, so it's kind of, um, going back to your finger on the pulse thing, I, I kind of, I think two things. I'm not trying to change, so I like change. I like doing things that, that's like that, so that doesn't bother me. Keeping your finger on all the latest innovation and all that, that's very, very difficult, I think. I think, uh, you know, we have a very, very young team across Modern Sky and Sound City as well, and so they they help me and others with that, really, you know, um, to kind of um, to make sure we're always, or trying to be at least, as relevant and current thinking as possible, really, on stuff. And not, but also by the same token, not just sailing down the NFC stream just because you need to, really. But, but at least being aware of it and thinking, oh, wow, that's interesting. What could we do with that? Or oh, that's not interesting at all. Let's just dismiss that, really, you know. And is that the same with with artists and talent bookings? Are you still, you know, trying to be in, in, in clubs and gigs every week to understand, you know, what's going on in the scene? Or is it something you kind of lean on some of the younger members of the team to inform as well? Mixture of two. I I, I, I love going to gigs. So so I, I, I stopped going to... I was traveling a lot before the pandemic. Um... I developed a real bad sciatic pain. as well. I'd never had a pain in my life, but it was terrible. And I thought I was never going to walk properly again. So I'd stopped going to a lot of gigs because I thought, you know, I couldn't stand at them and stuff. I was, I was getting a lot of pain. And then during um, lockdown, less traveling. And, you know, like everyone was twiddling the thumbs, different ideas. It's when that Bowie thing had come up. And, and I thought, what am I going to do here? You know, we've got to do. So I was riding my bike more than I'd ever done, you know, meeting a lot of our bands on bike rides. We're going on bike rides everywhere. And, uh, and I took yoga up. This Adrian Mishler on on YouTube, you know, doing these <laughs> YouTube videos. I do yoga every single day in my life now, at least for, for, for fifteen minutes or thirty minutes or maybe forty five minutes, but no more than forty five and no more than no less than fifteen every every day in my life, Un, unless you know the, the odd day not not there. And it cured all my sciatic thing and all that. So once I got back to gigs again, I thought, oh no, I'm going to go. Two reasons really: a, I was cured of every, no pain, and b. I'd missed them so much because it'd been taken away from us. So I've been going to more gigs than ever. Fezzi's is still a weird one though because I don't like camping. Yeah. So I like, I, I, you know, I still like a nice hotel. <laughs> um, but I'm still, I am going. To, you know, I'm, I'm I can travel again now and all that. So I'm, I'm um, I, I will go to Fezzi's, but I'll just go for the day really. Or if it's if our artists are playing over a couple of days of festivals, I'll. I'll go for two, but stay in a nice hotel down the road or something, you know. <laughs> I guess that's the beauty of uh, Sound City being in the city as well. That's the beauty of what we <laughs> no used to wellies. call it, Glastonbury, but without the wellies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, that'd, uh, <laughs> I'd buy a ticket straight away. Um, where did the idea come from for Sound City? Um, I, I'd worked with um, Tony, as you said, you know, on, on a Tony Wilson on an event called In the City for a number of years. So In the City was was the forefather of, of Sound City. It, you know, it, it was, um, in the city was the first event of its kind in Europe. And it was, um, it was a way, it was every year with, in the city, we would put on 54 of what we would consider to be the best unsigned bands 
in the UK, primarily in the UK. And there'd be a huge music business conference. People from all around the world would come from America and everywhere because it was the only events of its kind. And they'd come from all around the world. And we'd put these 54 bands on and we wouldn't tell anyone who the bands were. So if you were an A&R person or a lawyer or whoever, you had to be in Manchester or Liverpool or Dublin or wherever we took it that year to see those bands. Now, probably 30 of them were crap. But there was there was probably five of them every year that were you had to see and use any A and R scout or A and R manager did not want to miss them. So we famously put on Radiohead, we put on um, Coldplay, we put on Muse, we put on um, who else did we put on? Oh my goodness, um, so many that that came through that came through in the city. I mean, in the city really was the breeding ground for that, and there was because there was no other festival of its kind like that we truly was where those bands were discovered you know Coldplay were famously signed by Caroline Ellery in the city when there was about eight of us watching them you know there was, there was no one in there really you know uh, you know and so she signed up for publishing then they went on and got a record deal after that but you know so that was it went and, and in the city ran for many years through the 90s um into the noughties and then well, MySpace came along and MySpace came along, so, you know, so, you know, technology kind of disrupting things again, you know, so te- it came along. And so all the bands that we were offering to play in the city, they were all going online saying, oh, we're playing in the city. So all the A&R there would just check out their MySpace, decide, don't like them, don't like them, don't like them. And then didn't have to come in the city anymore. They would just go and check out that band because they knew then who they were. So that was a disruptor. And and also there was new kids on the block as well. So a tiny festival that had been coming to in the city for every year, every year they came to in the city um, and they were tiny and we ignored them for every year because they used to invite us over every year. We never went with South by Southwest and they, they used to love in the city and then they'd set up their event influenced by in the city. And, and then eventually I went to South by Southwest and I went, wow, this is amazing. This is amazing. This is what we should be doing for in the city. And at that time, Tony was very ill. Um, and so didn't really have the energy or the wherewithal to, to, to really reinvent in the city. And his partner, Yvette, um, you know, was kind of obviously taking care of Tony and, and being with Tony at that time. And, 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 and they'd lost their energy a little bit for it, the truth be known. So, so, so I decided to leave it in the city and I set up the year that Tony died, I set up Sound City. And so Sound City was was the best bits of in the city that that I thought was still relevant, the conference side of it and the in conversations and the arrogance and the and the northernness of it and that kind of thing. And then the best bits I could steal from South by Southwest yeah. or that, that I'd seen at South by Southwest. Because I first went to South by Southwest in 2006 and then I did my first party there in 2007. Um and so South by Southwest was, was the influencer for it. And the idea was, was again, that, you know, Liverpool is a 21st. So when I was trying to sell it to Kev McManus in Liverpool to say, look, you should have a conference and festival here uh, and to get a bit of money off them in those, those days, it was saying, look, Liverpool's a 21st century. Liverpool's one of the greatest music cities in the world, but it's not relevant anymore. All we do is talk about the Beatles and Cream, you know, and it's like, Where's the relevance now? You know, we if you, if you want it to be seen relevant going forward, it needs to become a 21st century music city. So we should have our own music business conference here. We should be bringing people from all around the world here every year. You know, and so that was the idea of Sound City, really. You know, and and so so that that was that was that was the nugget of it. And and then you know, if you'd have said we would still be here 15 years later, I mean, I always had the ambition we would. I think the key thing now for in the city, the Sound City, because it's changed so much. Over the years, I mean, the ethos has never changed, but the, the shape of it's changed over the, over the years. Is um, is staying relevant? Staying relevant is the key thing, really, because our audience who are coming to Sound City this year, fifteen years ago, they were probably four years of age or five years of age. A lot of them, really, you know. So, so you know, it, it's it's how do you keep it relevant? You know, you can't just assume your audience is always going to come year after year because our twenty-year-old audience is now late thirties or, you know, mid to late thirties and stuff, and maybe not going as much to those types of things anymore. So it's about reinventing it all the time. It's about keeping it relevant and, and, you know, and never being complacent, I guess, you know. How did you launch it back then? Cause it was 2008, is that yeah. correct? Um, 
year of Capital of Culture. Obviously, launching events now is sort of Facebook, Instagram, now TikTok's popping up. Yeah. What did it look like when you were launching a festival back then? A lot of a lot of physical marketing materials, really. So 60-40s all over the city. Yeah. Uh, flyers. Um, you know, that, that was the way you did it. It was the 80-20 rule, really. So 80% of our marketing was physical, 20% of it was online. Yeah. Now it's probably 95% online, 5% physical, really. Probably not even 5% physical anymore. I did actually notice that we got some Sound City posters up on the street coming into town today. My car was in the garage, so I got the bus into town. Yeah. And um, I thought, oh, there's some posters, some of our posters. You know, because you look out the window, don't you? Yeah. You get a chance to look out the window and saw some Sound City posters. I thought, why? Why are we still doing them? Like the, <laughs> I, you know. I think it's gone full circle, though, because I've, I guess when I first started promoting events, um, and I guess where, where Mustard Media started was when, um, I guess like the, the dark arts of social media ads were starting to become a thing. So yeah. uh, Rob, Ed and Ollie, who started Mustard Media, they were at Warehouse Project and Park Life, and they were like, look, we've, we've got, you know, we can run ads on, on on social media, we can target people, we can get data. Yeah. And everyone's minds were blown. And that's, you know, that's Mustard Media got pretty big in the early years because no one was uh, was really ahead of the curve. So, you, yeah. so then you could see return on investment, you could see, impressions reach all of that so that really accelerated but then i think it's gone to a point where brands can be too digital and there's nothing better than just going into town seeing a poster and thinking oh that's on this week because what happens when you go on instagram you're it's true. getting hit with beauty ads football ads like everything else and your thumb is like twitching because it wants it's to right. keep scrolling it's absolutely and right and i love tangible, tangible things too. again it goes back to what you said before you know so i said why but it did it brought a nice little smile to my face i just didn't know they were doing them i suppose but you know the other thing is bands still love posters as well you know they, you know you talk to bands and um one of our bands crawlers you know they were saying uh one of our posters going up in the states because they're doing their first North American tour. You know, can we see some of our posters going up in the venues and around the states? Yeah. And, all? and these are kids. They, they, these are you know these are so massive on TikTok. You know, Holly is a, you know she's unbelievable all over TikTok. Massive, um, you know, millions and millions and millions of followers. But but with one of our threads just earlier today saying, hey, can we see the posters for yeah. things like that? Because they get excited by it, you know, and I think that's the, that's artists. I think, you know, you do like to see your name either in lights or on a poster or whatever, because it's real then, isn't it? You know, yeah. like you said, it's, it's, it's a... Or like in, uh, when you land in Ibiza, you're kind of looking out for yeah, the posters, exactly, yeah. I don't yeah. think that will ever completely go away. No, no, I think absolutely. It, it makes it feel real. I, I don't know yeah. that the dwell time is much longer looking at a poster rather than social media because your brain is just wired that, yeah. to... The yeah. whiz pass. So I think it's we'll never kind of go back to the kind yeah. of 80, 80 20, but I think people are realizing you can't be, especially with, with a lot of new brands and, and new festivals. You know, we work with a lot of new festivals starting from scratch, and you need some physical presence for people to make it feel real. And it yeah. needs to be in the yeah. right spots where you know those people are because social media, I guess the pro is at the target and is so vast, but you can almost, you, you don't you don't know who those people yeah. are that are seeing it necessarily. I think of the perception of it as well. I always like the idea of parking the tanks on other people's lawns. I saw a lot of park light posters in various parts of London while I, when I've been down the last few weeks, really, you know, I thought it always brings a nice smile to my face, you know, when you kind of think, uh, yeah. you know, putting them positioning a Northern festival really, you know, next to, next to some of these kind of Victoria Park festivals, or whatever, you know, it's yeah. good. I like that. And you can use them as a, as a statement piece as well, you know, with, um we've worked at loads of festivals like you know maybe don't do print all over the, the country because obviously it's really expensive but you can get one big statement billboard with a really incredible piece of artwork or a yeah. really kind of big statement where our project again do it with um they'll kind of go you know around the satellite cities and say you're only x number of miles or minutes from, from right, manchester yeah. they don't even put the lineup on there they don't yeah. they don't need to yeah. or you know the big uh, tagline of for, for 12 weeks the city is ours uh, I remember yeah. one year they did the, um, you know, the dove uh, as part of the brand, and they just put a massive dove in the northern quarter, yeah. no logo. That no dove branding was beautiful, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Like a, I remember the golden dove that they had on that thing. Yeah. Yeah, and just just having that in the northern quarter was yeah. was enough of, of of a statement piece, really. Um, so talk talk me through the first event. Then did you uh, did you have a gauge on how successful it was going to be? Again, going back to social media, you haven't got the followers and the engagement no. to know how, how well you only it's going know, to go. don't you? About you know everything was measured by ticket sales. It seems strange now because that first event, I, I remember with the team we were working with at that time because it was myself, uh, Rich McGuinness, Mark Mark Jones from Medication and Revo, and uh, and Chris Meehan, who who owns Centric, you know. And um, 
So they, we were the core team on it at that time. And I always remember two, two things. I always remember Chris and Mark pulling me into the office that we had. We, we were over by Lime Street in them days. And because um, I'd said, we've got to have, I think, because Great Escape had just started as well, you know. And so I said, uh, they have 200 bands on. We've got to have 350 bands on. And they went, why? I said, because just we've got to have more bands than them. We've just got to, <laughs> we've got to, because if, if we look bigger, in year one, then we are bigger, you know what I mean? And and the way of doing that is is, is just having so many bands on emerging bands. I said, but yeah, that means more venues, more cost. And I said, no, no, we got to do it. And I remember him trying to talk me out of it. So that was a, a it was a, in, in in hindsight a big mistake, really, in many ways, because it cost a fortune. But <laughs> but it kind of it did work in in one sense that 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 it, that it went from zero to a hundred mile an hour quite quickly, really, because it felt like. When people came, it was completely shambolic, the organisation really, because it was, you know, no one had done it before. I always remember it's the nobody had walkie-talkies in them days, so it was it was just all your mobile phone. Yeah. And and I think we said, all right, we're going live now. It's a Friday because of the conference. He said, right, good luck everyone. Here we go. You know, ten o'clock, whatever it was on a Friday, we're off. And my phone never stopped going. It was just problem after problem after things we just never thought about, you know. And what, things, well, yeah, what, what type of things? All kinds of things, you know. The, 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 the venues not having the right sa- sound systems, bands been given the wrong advancing information, catering running out of food. Um, oh, goodness knows what. Just p- communication problems primarily. We hadn't, to all of the stakeholders, so, you know, sponsors not getting the falling way below their expectation of what was meant to be. You know, the list went on and on and on, really. Um, so it's just firefighting all the time, firefighting. Also, it was all cash driven, so you had to pay bands. I always remember them days. I was walking around with tens of thousands of pounds in bags because you had to pay <laughs> bands cash. Nobody, nobody did box transfers then. It sounds crazy. It's only 15 years ago, but everyone had to be paid in cash. Bands would not go on stage unless they got their money. You know, they had to get the money. So, you you know, with 350 bands, that's a lot of cash, you know, that's, that's being paid. So, so that, that things like that, um, the, the audience as well being used to the model. So, so, cause, cause from day one, another thing that Mark didn't agree with or any of them actually, because because I think even Rich said, no, we'll make far more money if we sell every venue individually. You know, so you've got to pay to it. I said, but that's not a festival. That's a load of gigs going on. So the festival is, 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 is you know, you, you get in, so it's got to be, and that was the South by Southwest idea and in the city. So it's a wristband. You just have one wristband go to it. You can't do that in a city. I said, you can. I said, it's just a wristband you showed at the door. You go in, that's that's the thing that you get in the thing. And it sounds crazy now, but but nobody was doing that at that time. That was... It was us that started that idea of a wristband in, in a city centre model, really, you know, of running around a festival, a music festival to do that. And, and there was all kinds of issues with that because the wristbands, the I remember the, the cramp, crimping mist thing that we had with them. They, they, they weren't crimping them right. So you had a wristband. You were going in a venue, getting all your mates' wristbands, taking them out, giving them to all their mates, bringing them all in. So, you know, there was just loads of kind of stuff going on like that, you know, was the, where the wristband wasn't on on the right way there was there was stuff going on where the, the security because the venues weren't used to the fact of a festival you know that that it's you know a festival in a city they was letting anyone in you know so it's like said no they've got to have a wristband but this is the way it works you know you you're, you're now the security for the fez you've got to look at these so it was all crazy crazy things like that 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 was just you know teething problems really thankfully a lot of people had bought into it beforehand, so we'd sold a lot of tickets for the first year. Um, and, and even though we had all those issues with people getting in for nothing and all that kind of stuff, we were okay because we had we had sold quite well. And, and I think the other thing about it, even though sponsors, it wasn't quite the experience they they were after. They loved it as well. You know, they, they'd never quite felt like anything like it. So so we had a lot of people coming to us the next year who'd worked with us, who worked with us for a lot of years afterwards, actually, and... and uh, and and we and, and it was a lot easier because it went so well that it was a lot easier the following years to get more sponsors in. So they were things that worked well. But I think we got a bit cocky as well. I remember thinking, you know, when we'd done it and there was people who'd come over. There was a guy who'd come over from um, Dubai who was a promoter in Dubai. And uh, and, and uh, he, um, 
he owned a lot of venues in, in Dubai and, and was a big music fan, had a, on the face of it a lot of money. And so he said, I want to bring Sound City to Dubai. And, and you know, and, and he kind of said, and I'll give you this to do it. And we went, wow, okay. <laughs> so we just went, and, 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 you know, there was an arrogance about it as well. I said, okay, we'll do Sound City Dubai then, you know. And that was when we decided, you know, we're going to do it all over the world now. This is what we're going to do. It's not just going to be in Liverpool. We'll have our main events in Liverpool, but we're, we're planting flags everywhere else and we're doing business everywhere else. It's a daft idea to go to Dubai. It wasn't a daft idea to go some of the other place we went, but Dubai. And I remember we took 120 bands to Dubai. We, you know, we took Ian Brown, we took Happy Mondays, we took Doves, we took the Cortinas, Wombats. The list went on, you know. And I remember the night before they all flew in, I was in Dubai with Chris Meehan, who's, who's the centric guy, you know. And the guy who was running it just said, uh, I've got a problem. I've not got enough money to pay for all of this. And he, and he literally dropped it on us the night before all the bands came. You know, we hadn't paid half the thing. Oh, and that was, you know, that nearly bankrupted us the whole thing. You know, it was, it was a disaster. So running before we could walk really was a massive thing. So we always call it the Dubai debacle now. But um, <laughs> it was, you know, it was everything from Russian gangsters and everyone. He had to give his passport to this guy to get a suitcase full of money. He had to give his passport over to him. Um, this guy did not owe us, me and Chris. But we were just making up these cash flow forecasts and everything else to try and get the money off this guy. Um, but we managed to get through it, but it wasn't, it was so bumpy. So in the, you know, in the early days, we were just saying yes to everything. We were kind of, it was dead excited again. It felt punk rock all over again, really, you know. So I should have been older and wiser by this stage. You know, I've been in the business <laughs> a long time by then doing after doing. But you don't, you know, I, I, I kind of... Um, Maybe some people do learn very, very quickly, but but I like the idea of if it sounds exciting and it sounds like this would be good fun, um, then, then, you know, I like to, you know, I'll have a look at it really, you know. If you'd go back in time, would you still have said yes to all yeah, these things again? I would, I would, I think, yeah. I wish I'd known what I knew now because I'd, I'd, do, I'd do it. I wouldn't take 120 bands, I'd take a lot less. <laughs> um, and I'd do things slightly different. But, you know, we'd do it again, yeah. Funny enough, I'm still very good friends with that guy in, in Dubai. Just before the um, just before the lockdown, I was going to China for one of my strategy meetings in China with our partners over there. And I always go just before Chinese New Year, New Year which is obviously in January every year. And so on that trip in 2020, I stopped by in Dubai on the way and I stayed there for a few days with with, the, with this promoter guy. And we sat there and, and, and when we were having a drink, we were, we were sharing stories about that episode. And he went, should we do it again? And I actually said, yeah, let's do it again. <laughs> you know, so we talked about it. We've not talked about it since because then I went to China and then I came out and then the, 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 all the madness uh, happened then. I've spoke to him since on social media, but I've not been over to Dubai since then. So maybe I'll go back and we'll plan it again, really. But, you know. but when you reflect on all the events that you've, you've done since then, what, what is the one thing that you wish that you, you knew now, you knew then that you know back, um, uh, you know now? Oh, I don't know. It's a good question. I, Cause I think I knew most of it then, you know, what they always say, don't let your heart rule your head, but I like my heart ruling my head. Yeah. You know, I kind of like that. Um, Cause if you just let your head rule your heart, life will be a bit boring. I think, you know, um, you know, so I always now, you know, if we're doing any project or whatever, you know, I, we've got great finance people, you know, Sam who runs all of our accounts and everything, he's amazing. So I'll sit down to Sam and say, does this make sense, Sam? And he'll say, it doesn't make sense, Dave, you know, for whatever reason I'll say, but I want to do it. So we'll, so, you know, I, I, I'll, before I leap in now, I'll, I'll, I'll always be a little bit more, you know, because obviously there's a lot of people employed now as well. In those days, it was me. You know, we've got 20 odd staff now. So you, you've you got to be quite careful about the way you do things. You know, you can't, you don't want to risk people's livelihoods by by bankrupting the company, really, you know. So so I'm, I'm a little bit more careful like that. So if anything, I've learned that is to be, don't jump in too quickly these days, like, you know. Um, you mentioned the first year was was a was a huge success. Tickets ticket sales went really well. The the feedback was great. What was it that made it such a success? What made I think it was brand new. I think it was new. You know, it goes back to what I said before. In those days, Liverpool was a music city, but it wasn't a music city. It was just a lot of fragmented gigs. You know, there was there was no scene as such in Liverpool. 
you know, the the the, the only scene that it, that had happened any time in recent history at that time was probably the bandwagon scene with the coral and the zootons and stuff. You know, that was it really. Um, there was nothing really going on that was um, that was a deep, you know a defining moment really about what what the city was about. For many years, Manchester had in the city, so that had been that had been the glue really that, that, that made the industry come to Manchester and, and still saw Manchester as a twenty first or a, you know a twentieth century twenty first century music city. Liverpool didn't have that. It just felt like Liverpool was, you know, the a lot of music lovers, but but no real no real kind of uh, nothing to bar- glue them together. And so I think Sound City did that, you know, for the first time ever, it brought all the venues together. And so all the reviewers, so, you know, you you saw things like Get Into This came out of it, Sound City, you know, they set up because they loved Sound City and said, oh, you know, we could we can set up our own blog right and about this, you know, and, you know, Centric Music came out of it, you know, I think. So it, it gave people, you know, it made people, give people the confidence in the same way as I said, Tony, instilled the confidence into me. I think, I'm not saying I did that, but I think Sound City instilled confidence in people and, and made them believe in the city a little bit more again from, from a musical point of view, really. And since then, it's it's evolved. You've kind of pivoted in different directions, whether it was moving to the waterfront. I know at one, one point you added a bit more of a dance element to it, took that back out. As you've evolved it over the years, what's gone into that decision-making process? Is it like a gut feeling, a hunch that you've got, or do you kind of listen to the, the customer feedback? Do you listen to the team? How do you make that? Bit of decisions? both. You, you do listen to the customer feedbacks. They're important. So, you know, we always ask people, who would you like to see on Sound City this year coming up, you know, when, when we're booking. So we we book, you know, generally we'll be booking if it's, you know, October, November every year, you know, for your headliners. And so just before that, you'll always go to the fans and say, oh, who Remember last year how amazing it was, you know, because you'll go on with your early birds. Who would you like to see this year? You know, and, and people will say big bands, of course, that you're never going to book because some people don't get it, what it's about. And then you'll get others who'll say, you know, to give you clues about things that's coming through really, you know, about bands or artists. You think, oh, wow, yeah, okay. And then you'll you'll find things yourself that you didn't know about, you know. So, so customers are important to listen to. And then other times, you know, we've got great bookers. You know, Steve and Jamie, who are main bookers for the festival, they've got great ears. You know, I trust them, you know, trust them absolutely to get us the best lineup, you know, for, for, for the festival. Or, you know, within budget and with what's available every year, really, you know. Um, I don't think we're ever taste-led. You know, we don't try and book necessarily buzz bands. We try to be, we try to get bands before other festivals like Part Life or like any other bigger festival would book them really. Our, our thing is emerging talent, is finding it before they're big. And I think the other big thing that we're absolutely committed to, and I think that's primarily um, come from Becky, who's our MD now, you know, for Sound City, is the key, is our commitment to key change. So we've been committed to key change now for the last four years, five years maybe. Um, and we're the UK ambassador for key change, you know, so, so it's making sure we give them, uh, female representation, you know, on the festival uh, in a meaningful way as well, not 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 in a tokenistic way, you know. So, you know, you know, to try and get that 50-50 gender balance right across the festival. And for the last four events that we've done um, in the real world, not not the ones we did online, well, even the ones we did online, we're very, we're, 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 we hit that target as well. But if you look at our lineup again this year, we consistently, you know, delivered that right across our headliners through to, you know, all the way through the bill really. So I'm very proud of that. Um, and we work hard at that. I know Becky really, really works hard at that to instill that into the team as well to do it. And she's worked so hard at it that it's it's now, it's it's part of the blood flow of the company now. You know, people get it now. But but I know with early on, she found it tough to, to, to get that, you know. Um, you know, because because people say, well, you can't, you know, there's there's not that many female bands out there. There's not that many, you know, but there are, you know, you just got to be not lazy. And I think, um, and so that that's something that's, that I'm very proud of. And I think she's done an amazing job doing that as well. 
When it comes to spotting emerging talent, I know you mentioned Ed Sheeran was someone you had it in the early days. Lizzo, one of my mates actually showed me a video where they, they saw Lizzo in this kind of tiny venue in Liverpool before she blew up. Um, you've got quite a good track record of of of, of booking talent and you know emerging talent before they they blow up. How do you know who's gonna who's gonna blow up? You don't. Do you? Is it you a don't. good feeling? Is it? I mean, Ed Sheeran, you got a good feeling that year with him. We booked him for two shows in Bumper. You know, and 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 you That's know, he, he was. You just, you kind of got a sense he was going to, you know. But still, it was bumper. You know, you know, you felt like 30, 40 people watching him in there, like you know, um, you know, Florence. No, I, I thought she was terrible. You know, she. Sorry, if you'd have said to, she was so shy. It was just her and another guy at the time. You know, she was banging a drum. She, she, you know, she's singing, but she she played a drum as well in the very early guise of Florence and the Machine. Um, and she was very shy, you know, or, you know, relatively shy. I remember her being not the person she's become, you know. Wow, she's one of the most amazing um, front, front people in, in, on the globe now, isn't she, you know. Um, but but I didn't see that coming. Ed Sheeran, yeah, you, you could see that coming. I'm trying to think of uh, who else. And is, is it the... Obviously, the music is the most important part of it, but especially now with the bookings, is it, you know, you're looking, you're, are you trying to hear a sound that you think is really kind of forward thinking or is it, you know, social media following? Is it, you know, they've got hype in, in the press around a specific reason? Like, is there a formula that goes into spotting someone that is going to be, you know, quite big in the future? Yeah, and, and, and it's, but, but, but it's not, a, it's not as formulaic as, you, as you'd imagine, really. The, you know, the, there's, a, there's a bit of data, there's a bit of, you know, so there's algorithms and data in there, yeah. And then there's a good pinch of gut feeling, yeah. you know, in there as well, really. So, you know, it's a bit like, uh, you know, I'll say to Steve or something, and said, uh, Mikey from This Feeling called me, you know, he said, uh, have, you, have you heard of this band, blah, blah, blah? I'd heard of them. Well, let's have a look at them. Oh, yeah, we'll have a look at them. They look good, actually, yeah. Who's on them? Let's have a look at them. And then, so, you know, it's a bit of that, really, you know, the promoters from Scotland will phone you or promoters from around, you know, di different parts of the country and say, yeah, you're on these, you're on these. Because particularly with it being the label side of it as well now, so our tentacles, you've got to be early, really. You know, particularly we want to sign something for records. You know, we got Lathams, for example. So, you know, Lathams, Lathams, you know, when, when we found them, you know, I, I remember we, we went and ma we met them and literally said we were managing them. And then the whole world blew up around them. You know, we, everyone wanted them within 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 two weeks. And so timing was everything with that. If we hadn't got to that band and started managing them there and then, they were only 17 at the time, you know, we'd have missed them completely, really. So you've, you've got to be always have your eyes and your ears and your nostrils and everything ready <laughs> to go um, on everything because you'll miss it. Like another one was Brooke Combe, this amazing artist we found in lockdown, Twitter. You know, she's singing a cover on Twitter. I said, wow, she's amazing, great voice. We just got in touch with her. Just got in touch with her and said, oh, you love your cover. Um, have you got anything else? She goes, oh, I write my, you know, she said, I won't do a Scottish accent. She said, I write a lot of my own stuff. I said, oh, send us a SoundCloud link to it. She sends us these demos she'd sang in her bedroom. Oh, I just blew it away. You know, think, God, this girl writes songs as well. So I said to Elf, you works with us, said, right, get a train, but we're going to Edinburgh. We're going to go up there. We... She was only 17 as well. We, we got her with her mum. So we want to manage her, you know, and all this. And then again, Ireland, we had a sign to Ireland within six months. You know, it was, but it was, it, it's about that gut feeling. Again, there was no algorithms at all. There's no data on Brooke. But you've got to just believe your own ears sometimes and go, this girl has got, I mean, check her out, Brooke Combe. You know, she's just got the voice, you know, of a generation, really. She's unbelievable. I've listened to her, her, her and Jamie did a cover of Talking Heads. That's right, yeah, yeah. Love it, one of yeah, my favourite yeah, songs Yeah, that's ever. right. I mean, Jamie was another accident, really. You know, he's a lad who was sat on a plane and Jamie come up to me because we were doing the stage in Madrid, Sound City, we'd organised all the safety on that stage. And uh, I mean, Jamie just talked about bands he was into and all that. And I said to him, you should check out Talking Heads and all this, you know, that was in that conversation. I always take it back to the fact that was when I'm, I'm, I'm sure the, the nugget for when he got into them. But then I came back from Madrid, went to listen to him in a rehearsal room and he played me all these songs, which was on the first album we get by. And I went, these are amazing. You know, and he's just social commentary of what his life was really, you know. Um, 
And nobody, you know, every, everyone had just saw him as a footy fan. Um, but, but he's an amazing talent, Jamie. Um, and then Crawlers is another one, you know, everyone thinks it's an overnight success. We, we you know, we had every single label in the planet wanted to sign them, you know, and but it was two and a half years of developing them, you know, and find, finding them and, 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 and really building, building them as artists, really. So, so it doesn't, doesn't, you know, it's a lot of work can go into to try and develop an artist from a record point, from records point of view, from, from a promoter point of view. You've just, it's the same rule, really. You've just got to find them as early as you can and have good eyes and ears everywhere. I know. We spoke before the recording about your, your journey and the kind of highs and lows, and you mentioned blood, sweat and tears, which I thought was um, an interesting one to, to delve into. You know, you've had so many highs from like just probably watching these artists grow that you've, you've managed, you know, seeing Sound City grow. What have been some of your lowest and, and toughest moments? Um... Most recently, because you remember the most recent things, is is some of the the mental health issues that you see young people going through. You know, my son's twenty four years of age. He's a bit older than some of the bands that we work with, really. So just to give it some context. And you always worry about your own kids' mental health, and so you do. You have a duty of care, really, with 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 the bands that you work with and the artists that you work with, and so some of my lows is 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 the lows that some of them go through at times, really, and that kind of stuff keeps you awake at night. Not a lot of stuff keeps me awake at night, really. You know, money you'll always find you generally find a way touch wood to 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 get around money things and all that kind of stuff. But but people's mental health, you know, that's not something that's easily repaired, really, um, and not more and Money generally can't fix that unless you get a good good shrink or something, you know. Um, so so that's that's kind of that that's 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 a very um, you know kind of thing that that, that worries you that, that that keeps that keeps you awake. The the other stuff is 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 um, the lows. That there's been some bad times, but time mends those things really, you know. So at the time they seem really really bad. But none of them are ever life and death, really. You know, like like the Dubai one. It was it nearly broke the company. But you know what? If it had broke the company, just we wouldn't be here talking about Sound City now. But I'd have done something else. Yeah. You know, there'd have been something else I'd have done. Um. So I don't let things like that. You know, I don't let them keep me awake at night, and I don't let them. I don't dwell on them for too long, and I find them funny. In the end, I think you know they're, they're kind of they're good now. I'm glad they happened because if it had just gone all dead smoothly. You know, like that first event, if it had gone really, really smoothly, where's the stories and that? Where's the fun in that, really? You know, um, at the time it feels terrible, but on hindsight, it's, 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 there's always, you can always share stories with the people who were on those journeys with you, really, you know. It feels like there's always an element of risk going into anything in the music industry. Yeah. Not, nothing's and particularly to... live events. Yeah. Live events is, is, is probably the most risky because with live, live events, all the money's going that way before it comes this way. You know, and so and and there's there's no really getting off the bus either. Really, it's not like you can spend slow and then oh, I don't like this. I'm going to get out of it now. You can't. Once you're in, you're in. You know, so you know you 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 kind of you know you you kind of um, commit half a million pounds towards talent. You've you've got to then you're in. Yeah. You know, it's like now the money's got to come back sometime, really, you know. Sponsors, of course, can help take the pressure off that and, and, and lots of other things, really. But generally, ticket sales are a very important part of the mix for all of that. But that's kind of what's exciting. And it's not for everyone, you know, it's not for everyone that, you know. I've um, I've met a lot of people who want to get into promoting and once the, you know, that's the bit that keeps people awake at night, really, you know, when you think to yourself, you know, we're now that committed that that you know if this doesn't work then there's nothing, um, and there's always an element of that, particularly in the early days, when you when you're trying to set it up. So, um, and I'd be a liar if I just said I always buzzed off that I didn't. I didn't. I think you learn. No, never to buzz off it. You never buzz off that. Actually, it's not. A, there's no buzz in that. But you learn not to think about it or worry about it because you can't. And also when you've done it enough. You can begin to spot the signals about you know you know the way things are going really, so you can cut costs in other ways if you have to. So 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 they're not real lows. I, if I'm honest, Sean, there's not a lot of lows. You know, we are very privileged, really. It's 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 you know, I don't I would I don't want to moan about anything. I think it's you know it's not digging coal. Any of this, it's it's a 
you, with a generation, you know, if I think back to the way my old fella earned a living, it's a lot easier what I do, really, you know. My mum and dad still don't know what I do, really. <laughs> Same. <laughs> you know, even some people in our office sometimes say, what do you do? Like, you know? <laughs> um, but it's kind of, um, there's, there's no real lows. The only really lows is, is, is people's, you know, is, is health. It's people's health. If, 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 it, if it risks people's health. Then it's then it's that that's that's not a very pleasant thing, from my point of view. I think I'll uh, I'll probably be carried out of a venue in a box at some point, <laughs> you know, because because I because I you know I, I do I love I love that side of it really, you know. Do you, do you see yourself doing this forever? Yeah, I, I don't. You know, I've got friends, you know, because when you meet with because we're all a bit chameleon like, aren't we? You know, so you must have friends that don't work in this industry, you know, and uh, so when you see your mates. If we go away, if I go away with my mates on holiday or whatever we go, we don't talk about what we do. Unless they want guest lists for something or whatever, you know, <laughs> for their kids. So a lot of them, you know, they ask me for guest lists, but that's about as much as they dip into it. So I don't talk about their thing. I don't, and I, and I don't talk about my thing really. Um, but one thing I've noticed more and more with them when they're away is they're saying, oh yeah, you know, um, you know, a few more years and I'll be, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'll be able to retire or pension off. And I think so. And, and I don't say anything. I think, so. I'm not even thinking about that. So that must be good, really, when you don't even think about it. As long as it got me health, um, I'll keep doing it for as long as I can do it, really, because it, it keeps me young in here. <laughs> even if the body's giving up, the mind is, is young, and I hope that cat carries on. And I think, um, and I think the other thing about it is, is you know, it, it's it's a it, there's something good every day. Yes, there's days where, like any job, it's a pain, but for the most part, it's great. You know, you have the best times. When you're reflecting on all the memories, everything you've achieved so far, and I guess you as a person, like what do you think has made that journey so successful? Is there anything, any mantras you live by, any habits that you stick to? It depends how you measure success, you know. So, so, so you know, for me, for everyone, you know, money's important, you know, but it's never been the driving factor for me. Um of course, we all want to do. We want to do nice things in life and afford good things in life. But but having millions of pounds in the bank is not really for me. That's that that's not been that's not how I measure success really in my mind. Some people do, and I'm, I'm not saying they're right and I'm wrong or the other way around. The, everyone's right. It's just about how you see it. So for me, success has always been about being happy really and, and working with, you know, every day being different to some extent. Every day is not different, but but to change it up, you know. So so for me, success is is working with the bands I get to work with, is is going to different parts of the world to see them play live, is to see them grow as human beings and to see them grow as artists, you know, and and, and have their success, you know, in the way in the way that they define success. Um, it's it's seeing. All of our staff in Sound City now, the, you know, Becky's got kids now. You know, she started with us 15 years ago and she's got two boys now. Um, you know, Chris, our label manager, has got a daughter. Alfie's just had a little lad. You know, they're all success for me because it's like great, you know, because now if you'd have said to me 15 years ago, 16 years ago, that, that you're going to have all of this family, you know, extended family, I'd have thought you were mad, really, you know. But but it's it's I love you know I'm smiling now because it does it genuinely excites me, you know. I love seeing all the kids. So just before I come to you, I got me sandwich, didn't I? I yeah. saw you me, Chris, and I saw Chris Meehan. He was at the start of the journey. Oh, bro. He runs Centric, and uh, and his Sonny, his, his lad, his, his, oh, Oliver, sorry, it's, it's, oh, Alfie's lad's called Sonny. His lad's called Ollie, <laughs> and he said, "Oh, Ollie's here, you know, c come and see Ollie, you know." And then giving Ollie a little cuddle and thinking, oh, this is great. Like, you know, we've, you know, just seeing all of that. Cause I was, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I just love all those things about it really. It, it just makes me, that, that kind of stuff makes me smile. And next week, you know, bouncing up and down the streets of Liverpool again, when Sound City's on and discovering new bands again, you know, like everyone will be, you know, we'll all be discovering new bands again. That, that's you know to to be to be here doing that again and still being able to do it without without sciatic pain is a success you know that's great so so all of that kind of stuff is really good for me you know I think uh, and and long may that continue really long may that continue you know for me that that will be me having a successful and a happy life I think you know yeah love it.
Well, listen, I know you've got a lot on for um, for Sound City next week. I want to wish you all the best of luck. I can't wait to see all the coverage across the city. I'm sure it'll be a huge success. And yeah, thank you so much for your time, your honesty. It's been really inspiring listening to everything you've done. Thanks, Sean. It was great talking to you. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> Thank you.